Good afternoon, fellow ruminators. Welcome back to another session. Rumination with Andrew. Thank you so much for joining as we are about to discuss a very important topical matter. And today we are going to be looking at Mark Golding's, um, should I say, lack of response, you know, to the murder carnage, the rate of murders that we see in Jamaica. And recently there was a very sad report coming out of Clarendon, a parish in Jamaica that experienced a gruesome murder. Um, that's the community of, I think it was uh, some tree lane um, in Clarendon, right, in Clarendon. That was in, uh, you know, I forgot the name of it, but let us look at the Observer and read from the Observer, the, the information coming from the Observer. It's Cherry, Cherry Tree Lane in Clarendon, right? So that's the name of the community. Cherry Tree Lane in Clarendon. That was where the murder was actually carried out, right? Um, performed on Sunday night, I believe. It happened where gunmen went up on a family, it seems, or upon that community and killed a number of people. Let's hear from the observer the specific, you know, details as regards that sort of gruesome murder. The smell of blood and loud wails from grieving relatives of the victims of Sunday night's mass killing in Cherry Tree Lane in Clarendon permeated the atmosphere on Monday morning, telling the tale of the terror which unfolded while people played a game of bingo and listened to music at a birthday celebration from just outside a bar. So they were actually having birthday celebrations. A total of eight people, including a seven-year-old boy, were shot dead, while nine others were injured by gunmen's bullets in what is believed to have been a reprisal for a shooting incident a few years ago. Right? So that's interesting. The deceased have been identified as seven-year-old Aidan Bartley, 27-year-old uh, Cabell Daly, 50-year-old Lawrence Francis, 20-year-old Diamond Bennett, 68-year-old Errol Stewart, 32-year-old Jermaine Booth, Courtney Messam, and a woman known only as Margaret. One of the victims was shot dead in a separate part of the community, some distance away from the others as the gunmen made their escape. That is what they're suggesting here. Now we have here the relatives of 20 year old victim Diamond Bennett initially showed signs of strength when the Jamaica Observer and journalists from other media entities arrived at their house. However, as they recounted their last moments and conversations, with the young woman, tears flowed down their faces. Now, Marjorie Johnson, the mother of Fennett, said she did not know the right words which could describe how wonderful her daughter was. She was at work when she got the call that Bennett had been killed. And this is now Bennett's mother speaking. I couldn't even hear the person on the phone because she was crying out loud. I thought she said something about my son, but I kept getting calls that it was Diamond. My boss released me and I went straight to the hospital. When I went there, Diamond was in emergency, so I couldn't see her. The doctor came out and asked if I was her mother, and I said yes. She asked me if I knew that she died, and I said no. She said they tried their best, but she couldn't make it, Johnson said, as stares began to well up in her eyes. Diamond was a loving, caring, and jovial person. Words can't express my last moment with Diamond was Saturday night. I was supposed to attend a party and I asked her if she had a drive and she said no. I said, since you don't have any drive, I'm going to go to my bed. I did not know if she went to the party because she lives with her boyfriend. That was the last time, Johnson said, before sharing that her daughter had her sights set on becoming a teacher. So this is a person, a productive, a potential productive person that we have lost to killing, to violent murder in Jamaica, right? This is the sort of Jamaica in which we live, in which we are functioning, and which our prime ministers and government preside over. Now, I would like to ask Mark Golding, what is Mark Golding's solution to the murder rate in Jamaica? Because I have not heard anything from him. You know, yesterday when the Prime Minister, that's Andrew Holness, was giving his press conference there, and I was listening on the GIS um, channel, the YouTube channel, you know, the Prime Minister mentioned that he has been trying to implement some policies to curb the levels, the high levels of criminality in Jamaica. But, you know, he was intimating or suggesting that the other side are not giving is not giving him that sort of liberty to do 
and to implement these effective crime policies. And I'm wondering why are our politicians constantly playing with the, the Jamaican psyche in terms of trying to deceive us to suggest that the other side is always trying to do their best. You know, at the end of the day, the murder rate continues unabated. Now, something that the prime minister and also the opposition tend to do, but particularly the incumbent government, they tend to tell us about reduction in criminal activities. Right. But when we talk about 17 percent reduction in crime and violence, as the prime minister is suggesting, 70 percent, 17 percent reduction in murder rates that he actually intimated yesterday. What does he mean by that? What are the raw figures? Because sometimes we are deceived by statistics in terms of percentages. You know, so let us say that you have uh, 10, you know, 10 people um, were not murdered, 10 fewer people who have been murdered. Let me put it like that. That could have been resulting in 10, 70 percent, but 10 10 people, few, you know, well, fewer than 10 people. All right. Or when we have let me I'm mixing up myself here. When we have a murder rate in which fewer we have 10 fewer people who have died. Right. That is what I want to say. You know, my thoughts were not coming together in my head. But when we have 10 fewer people who have died. It doesn't mean that that's a lot, because if we've been having, let us say we've been having a thousand people in Jamaica, we have 1500 people on average, which are murdered, who are murdered every year, right? 1500 people who are murdered every year in Jamaica. If we have of that 1500 uh, people who are murdered yearly in Jamaica, you know, if we have 20 fewer people, let us say it moved from 1500 to four to 1480, that's not a great decline. That's not a great reduction. But by percentage wise, it might seem to be that that's some, you know, substantive, you know, substantial reduction. But that is not necessarily so. And I think that our prime ministers need to also give us the raw data so that we can judge for ourselves when they tell us that there is a 17% reduction in crime and murder rates in Jamaica, in murders in Jamaica. I think we need to hear that. I think we need to have the raw data and that the journalists in Jamaica need to do more investigative studies on as far as these information, that information is concerned. Now, the prime minister also, in speaking to journalists, because they were asking him questions after his presentation, they were asking him, you know, about what are his policies, you know, and how will these policies affect uh, you know, the levels of crime and violence that we have in Jamaica. Now, the the, the journalists, you know, Mr. Holness was telling the journalists that they have to do their research and they have to look at what the prime minister is doing or is not doing. And I'm wondering if the prime minister is divulging sufficient information to the journalists, because in his presentation, he was suggesting that what happened in Clarendon on Sunday night is not just a mass murder as the papers were actually describing it, but he described it as an act of terrorism, right? So we're talking about domestic terrorism in Jamaica. Now, this has been ongoing for years. So we have been having domestic terrorism since the 1970s, I would believe, based on what the prime minister is suggesting here. And that, you know, he's working, that's Mr. Ponis is working with his, you know, um, intelligence partners, the intelligence agencies in Jamaica and along with intelligence agencies in the United States. Now, another question was being asked about the 31 domestic terrorists, which it seemed that Mr. Holness has submitted to the United States in 2022. The journalist asked him that question, asked, you know, what was resolved? What, you know, what came out of that submission of those 31 names of supposedly or allegedly or alleged terrorists in Jamaica? And his response was, yes, that he submitted 31 persons on, you know, the Jamaican terror list to the United States State Department, but he cannot give further details about it. And I'm wondering, this constant secrecy in government, how can we have a democracy, as we suggest that we have, right, yet still everything is shrouded in secrecy, where our governments believe that to protect us, they have to conceal information from the public. 
I really don't understand that for the life of me. And that's not only happening in Jamaica, but the United States has set that trend, that example to the world, and the world is following it. We, we believe that our leaders of government are secured to hide information from us and that the citizens should trust their government and our governments will take care of business, take care of matters. But, you know, when the United States was founded, for example, we understand that the journalists were antagonistic towards government, right? Because not that you should not have some amount of trust in your government, but you have to trust them when they have given us, right, evidence that they can be trusted. But in for decades now, particularly in Jamaica, we have been getting the impression and the analysis that we are getting from the government, the impression we're getting from them is that they cannot be trusted. So more so, we should now be insisting that they should actually provide raw data to us. And the journalists should have protect, should have really insisted that the prime minister talk more about the 31 domestic terrorists that were submitted to the United States. Now, if we don't know who they are, right? If we don't know who these people are, we could be on the list and we don't know, right? You could be on the list as an innocent person and you don't know. Because a lot of times when we think the government is working to put a dent into criminal activities, it's really making laws that will affect negatively the ordinary citizen, the one who is not committing crime. And that's the irony of what is happening today. The surveillance acts and these acts of terrorism often affect innocent people. And the criminals that they should be going after, they are the ones who go scot-free, right? That is what is happening in our world today. Let me turn this off. Right. So they are the ones who go scot-free, right? The ones who are actually the menace to society, the criminal, you know, um, elements of society the ones who have carried out the acts of terrorism and murder and, you know, they're the ones who are set free. And those of us who have never committed a criminal act, we're the ones who might be sent to prison or who might be deemed as terrorists, right? That is what we have to understand. We cannot trust everything the government says. And I think it should be important that the media houses get a copy of the 31 people that Mr. Honus has submitted to the U.S. State Department as, you know, possible terror threats in Jamaica, right? We cannot trust governments because we do not know when we are going to be, you know, held accountable for crimes that we have not committed, right? And I'm not very, very comfortable with the domestic terrorist laws that I am understanding Mr. Honus is about to, you know, craft, right? And to actually put on the books, the law books in Jamaica. Because he is adamant that what happened on Sunday night is an act of terrorism, which it seems to be because when you can go on up on a crowd of people at a party and just shoot them like that, it, this is an act of terrorism. Yeah, this is an act of terror. Right? But we need to delve into what really created that sort of occurrence. Now, I want to hear, Mark Golding, I want to hear from you, sir. What are the solutions you have to putting a dent in the crime and violence? I don't want to hear you talking about what Mr. Honus is not doing, right? Because a lot of times we hear that nonsense from you guys and you begin to play the political ball with people's lives, right? While you guys are protected, right? The Mr. Honuses and the Mr. Goldings are protected, but our people are left out there to deal with these criminal elements and these criminal people, right? Who are hardened and seasoned veterans of criminality. Now, there was a, there, there was a, a you know, a paper, a, a newspaper article that I pulled up and was trying to, I thought I'd actually um, 
yes, I think this is it. And I'm going to, I came upon this article some time ago. And this was actually coming from the Herald, right? The Herald. And this might have been in Jamaica at the time, a newspaper in Jamaica, the Herald. I think it's no longer, it has become defunct. It's now defunct, right? But this newspaper, the Herald, let me share my screen with you. The Herald, Vibes Carter responsible for 100 murders, right? Jamaican police commissioner, Owen Ellington, recently made some scathing statements about embattled dancehall DJ Vibes Cartel. Now, this news came from 2000. It was published on April 29, 2014. So this is some time ago. But this is the Vibes Cartel that has just been recently um, released from prison, who claims that, well, he has not claimed his innocence, but he pretends as if he is not innocent. In fact, he's so bold. Vibes Cartel has become so bold that he was on Anthony Miller's show the other day, suggesting when he was asked by Mr. Miller if he deems himself to be innocent, he says that there are many people who have committed much more crime, you know, much more crime that he has committed, right? And who seem to be much more hardened and seasoned criminals than he is, and they have gone scot-free. So he did not suggest that he's innocent. He's just comparing himself to people who he deems to be much more seasoned veterans of criminal of criminality than he is. So we have here it's a, that Vibes Cartel, real name Adija Palmer, is currently serving a life sentence in the maximum security prison after being convicted for the 2011 murder of Clive Lizard Williams. Throughout the high-profile murder trial, fans of the the incarcerated DJ have accused the police force and the crown of an unfair trial to bring down cartel. So we are the ones who want to have him back in our society. But listen to what this, this, this newspaper is reporting here. But during a recent interview on all angles, Ellington says that that's the former commissioner of police, Owen Ellington, says that Vibes Cartel was the mastermind behind a gang that murdered over 100 people, right? Now, this was is a very serious allegation, right? And we wonder if this has ever been investigated. That Vibes Cartel was the mastermind behind a gang that murdered over 100 people. Yet Vibes Cartel is suggesting here that he's innocent. And he is a victim of government abuse and that the government of Jamaica wants to bring him down. Vibes Cartel leads a gang that was responsible for well over 100 murders. And this is coming from Owen Ellington. And I'm not sure if Owen, Owen Ellington has, you know, recanted, if he has really apologized for making such a bold statement. But I'm sure as a former commissioner of police, that he would have had access to certain intelligence, to certain raw data that would have allowed him to have gone on national TV and aired such a damning statement against Vibes Carter. He continues, we have been telling the country this for a very long time. And every time we moved against this gang, we were criticized and we were condemned and we were accused of being malicious, right? So this is what is happening in Jamaica, where a, it's a society in which the government shows the face that it wants to reduce, right? And to diminish crime and violence in the country. On the other end, behind the scenes, you have that they're not trying to help the people who have, they've, they've put into authority to put the dent. So it clearly here, Owen did not have the autonomy to dismantle this alleged um, gang and their activities, right? That's what he's suggesting, that every time he tells them about it and he seeks to do something, they tell him that he shouldn't do anything, right? And that perhaps the consequences will follow if he does not adhere to leaving them alone. 
So when you hear your prime ministers are suggesting to you that they are going to, you know, put a dent in crime and in criminal activities, be careful about that, right? Just be careful about that because in many times, in many cases, they're not really doing that. They're aiding and abetting it. But they have to show you the face. They have to present a face suggesting to you that they are in fact doing their best. And I saw people in the chat box yesterday on the GIS program when the Prime Minister was delivering his speech about the gruesome murder act in Lime Tree Lane in Clarendon. Right? And they were suggesting that, yes, Prime Minister be hard. Go hard on crime and violence. But we can only the government can only go hard if the government and the economic elites are innocent themselves. What if some of them, I'm not suggesting here that all of them are involved, but what if some of them and the ones who are given the position to protect us, right, are also involved in criminal elements and in criminal activities, right? And I was watching a TikTok um, video of this Jamaican who actually went on TikTok and he was, I guess he's from Montego Bay, and he was reporting some of the communities in Montego Bay, right, that are plagued by crime and violence. And he was suggesting that all of these communities are constituencies of, that belong to, what's his name, Dr. Chad, right, who is the Minister of National Security, Horace Chad. Right? That's what he's suggesting. Now, I am not suggesting here on this show that that is true, but he lives in Montego Bay. And he'd be suggesting that Dr. Horace Chang, the constituency that he oversees or that he's in charge of, these are the communities in which you have the highest levels of criminal elements and criminality. It suggests something. It, it it really begs the question, why is Dr. Horace Chang the Minister of National Security? Why is he? And given the fact that Dr. Horace Chang is the Minister of National Security, why is it that he has not been able to decrease the murder rate in his own constituency? Because if he can't, decrease that rate in his own constituency, then how is he going to diminish the levels of crime and violence in the society at large? This is the question I'd like to pose to Dr. Horace Chang. Right? But whilst I'm on that, as I'm suggesting in the video, and the title of the video, I'd like to see Mr. Mark Golding and the PNP party suggest some credible crime strategies that can be implemented short-term as well as long-term to diminish the high rates of crime and violence evident in modern Jamaica, right? Because we are, in fact, the Wild West. It's almost like Jamaica has never been a civilized society, particularly after independence. We're gradually going back to the days of the plantation and to the level of violence and brutality that, you know, were evident on that in that system. Right? And the more you see the, 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 the disparities, the economic disparities between the rich and the poor, then you are going to have criminal elements being increased and the levels of criminality being, you know, augmented. Now, that's what Mr. Mr. Owen Ellington has been saying, that he has been telling the country and every time he moves against the gangs, he was criticized. His He and his team were criticized and condemned and were accused of being malicious. Right? 
and were accused of being malicious. And the same thing is happening on my channel also. When I speak the truth, and because Jamaicans are, you know, have this strong aver uh, you know, aversion, right, for the truth, right, they will say to you that, you know, I am the malicious person. Because we do not like to hear the truth. We do not like to confront reality. And we pretend because we are we are hypocrites in that society. All right? So here you have Mr. Holders. Well, it was under the PNP at this time. 2014 would have been under the PNP government. But they would have been presenting themselves as people, you know, who wanted to see the crime and violence. Well, give them their credit. You know, we, we have to give the PNP their credit that they actually were, it was under that administration, under, you know, under which Vibes Carter was imprisoned. And, you know, but it's, it, it's amazing to see that he has come out and he was defended by his lawyer, who is Isaac McCannon, is a, I, one of the most passionate, I should say, PNT followers. Very passionate about the party. And that is the party to which he's attached. No, I'm not suggesting that that is Mr. McCallum's right to be aligned with the People's National Party. And I'm not suggesting that he shouldn't. But it's interesting, the dynamics of how he was chosen because it seems to me that the others could not have gotten the previous lawyers, that the previous cartel's lawyers were not qualified enough and they were seasoned lawyers like the Bert Samuels were not qualified perhaps to get him out of prison. But you know, all of a sudden this miraculous effort was made by Isaac McCannon and he was able to get Vibes Carter out of prison which has cemented himself, he has now cemented himself in Jamaica as a prodigious lawyer, a prodigious criminal lawyer. But is Isaac Buchanan, is he really that prodigious? Now, Owen Ellington also weighed in on the controversy over police tampering with the evidence in the highly published trial that convicted Cartel and three of his friends on March 13, 2014. See what I'm saying? That the police tampered with the evidence. And that's what we heard in the courts too. That the jurors actually were bribed or one of the jurors was bribed. And that is why they had to throw, one of the reasons they had to throw the case out. Because you know, of that sort of, that act of bribery. Hmm? So even the police who are, who, who are sworn to protect the citizens have tampered with the evidence. That's what he's saying. This is, or was, the combination of police. This is not my word. These are not my words. These words are coming from a former Commissioner of Police, Owen Ellington. Hmm? And we think that people like Vibes Carter is innocent. The most free word boss. At the end of the day, our citizens are being killed every year. But let us see what he continues to say. Cartel will be eligible for a parole in 35 years. Right? So... This is this. I had to read you this because I thought this was a very interesting piece of information, right? And the allegations of Mr. Owen Ellington, former commissioner of police in Jamaica, that his hands were tied because when he wanted to have gone after the criminal or the criminals, they told him that he could not have done it because that would have been an act of of malice, a malicious act. Hmm? Now, here is a commissioner of police, if he's correct, because, you know, we can only take him at his word. But I am wondering 
if he were lying, would he have gone on national television to and uh, you know to 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 to, to 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 tell such a bold lie and to accuse people? Right? If he had that sort of tenacity, I think that he's evil. But I don't think, I think I trust what he said. Right? That Vives Carter is actually or was then the mastermind of a gang who had murdered 100 people. Now, Vax Cartel has, has found himself on many interviews, including, you know, Isaac McCann, his lawyer, and also Anthony Miller. And he's alleging, Vax Cartel is alleging that whilst he was in prison, he has all the facts, and I don't know who is giving him all the information. But he, according to him, since his imprisonment, since his incarceration in 2014, 11, right? Over 17,000 people have been murdered in Jamaica. And I think he was in prison for 13 years. Over 17,000 people were murdered in Jamaica. Right? And I think he made that point because he wanted to, to suggest that he could not have had any sort of impact on the rates of homicide in Jamaica because he was imprisoned. <laughs> so whilst he was in prison with no sort of influence on Jamaican people, Jamaican youths, why are they blaming him then for this sort of in order that influence that he has on the minds of vulnerable young people. But we don't know what Vance Carter was doing in prison. It's still a mystery. Whilst he was in prison, he's saying that he made a lot of money through the sale of gold and silver. And also he made some of his finest music in prison. So we are not sure what opportunities Vance Carter had in the prison cell. Vibes Carter is also suggesting that even though he has spent millions of dollars in his law uh, case, the, the, the court case that he had to have endured, he has spent millions of dollars. He says that he has earned back that money or close to that amount since he has been released. <laughs> now, Dives Cartel has been released, well, for how many, two, two weeks now or two weeks plus? Not a very long time. And you have been able to have made back those millions of dollars since you have been released. Who believes that? Right? So we don't know what Dives Cartel was doing whilst he was in prison. We do know that some of these drug cartels in the world, they do perform activities whilst they're in prison. Yeah. So don't be believe that everybody in prison, you know, is just distanced from the world and that they're not involved in what transpires in the real world. Right? Sometimes they are also involved. And I'm not suggesting on the show that Vibes Carter was involved, but there are a lot of mysteries that surround his incarceration and what he was doing in prison. Even this 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 uh this disease, this Graves disease that they say that he has, and the fact that he has come out and that he's going to be an advocate of this disease, and it's almost like it's a marketing strategy, right? It's almost like it's a mar marketing strategy. And this is the sort of Jamaica that we live in. But I would like to hear the opposition leader, Mark Golding, I would like to hear what is his take on Vibes Carter, right? Vibes uh, Carter's release, that is. And also, what credible crime plan does he have to combat crime on the island? 
And I don't want to hear any generalities. We talk too much in general terms about what he's going to do and, you know, and using whatever. We need to hear specific, we need to have specific plans as to how it's going to be done. Things that sound viable. That's what we need to hear from Mark Oday. But we have not heard anything from him, particularly about the release of this guy. And I'm sure that Isaac Buchanan has a very good working relationship with Mark Oday. What do you think, Mark Oday, about Vibes Cartel's release from prison. All right? It will be very, very interesting. And I'm quite curious to hear what Mark Golding has to say. But I think that he should have a press conference about cartels released from prison. Because this is a new sensation on modern Jamaica. And make no bones about it, Carter's release from prison is a message sent to Jamaicans at large that criminality is big business in Jamaica. Right? His release from prison is sending Jamaicans a clear signal, a clear message that criminality is the new law and order in Jamaica. That's what it is all about. Right? It's not just about making music and having Vibes Carter go out to have his to, to entertain his fans. Right? But it's to show you, because this is what the electron is saying, that Vibes Cartel, even though you think he's just a musician, was the mastermind of a gang that killed over a hundred people. What a serious indictment. What serious allegations to, or a serious allegation to have made against a very popular entertainer, right? Who is on his way to becoming an MP if not the Prime Minister or future Prime Minister of Jamaica. Right? This is the Jamaica that we live in. Right? And for those of you who are crying and supporting Vibes Cartel, I hope you're not crying when your family members or loved ones die. Hmm? Because Jamaica seems now to be a place in which... We want to have our cake and eat it at the same time. So you want to, to support criminal people and their deeds and yet have a crime-free society or live in a society where crime is not as high as it is in modern Jamaica. Right? That's what you want to live in. But that's an illusion. That is a serious illusion. That will never be. You can't have your cake and eat it at the same time. It's either you eat it, right, or you save it. But it cannot be done. Both cannot be done at the same time. So it's either you're going to have, you're going to, you are determined to rid the society of criminal elements so you can reduce significantly the high rates of crime and violence, or you are going to support criminal elements and allow the status quo to continue. Which do you prefer? Thank you so much for joining. I hope that you like, share, and subscribe. I look forward to uploading another video um, when I shall do so another time. Ciao. Have a great day.